I've been studying Matthew for the past couple months, making videos about it, and also getting ready to teach a course in the spring for Fuller Seminary. And I suddenly realized I never addressed the question, why study Matthew in the first place? Why am I spending all this time studying and reading commentaries and preparing stuff on Matthew? Even in seminary, the situation is the same. If you were in seminary and you're planning on which courses to take in the future, and you looked at the course catalog and you saw something like, this course will focus on a detailed exegesis of portions of the English text of the Gospel of Matthew. Emphasis will be given on exegesis, interpretive history, problems, theological understanding, and practical significance of the text. Well, doesn't that just convince you that you should take this course? Boring! And I even wrote that. I mean, there are 66 books in the Bible. There are three other Gospels, so why Matthew? But first, a digression. Last year, I was really hoping that my plant would put forth a flower, and this year, it did not disappoint. One flower, once a year, but I digress right now. Back to Matthew. First off, the Gospel of Matthew has been a favorite in the church throughout history. That doesn't tell us much, so let's look at why. Well, one reason is the attention Matthew gives to Jesus' teachings. The Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7 is one of the best known portions of Jesus' teachings in any Gospel. Second reason. Matthew constantly alludes or quotes from the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures to prove something about Jesus' life or to teach us something. But he does so in some very interesting and nuanced ways. For example, in the birth of Jesus, he quotes from Isaiah 7:14, Behold, a virgin shall bear a son. When he does this, he quotes from the Greek translation of the book of Isaiah, which has Parthenos for virgin. But the Hebrew text reads Alma, which refers to a young woman. The Hebrew word profiles her age, while the Greek, her sexual status. So what you say? Matthew used the Septuagint. Well, a few verses later, Matthew talks about the Holy Family having to flee to Egypt to escape Herod's attempt to kill the infant Jesus. Matthew then cites Hosea 11.1 1 to explain their being in Egypt. I called my son out of Egypt, Matthew 2.15. What's interesting here though, is that the Greek translation of Hosea reads, out of Egypt I called my children. But the Hebrew text reads, I called my son. Matthew appears to know both the Greek and the Hebrew versions of the Old Testament. And he's very careful down to the words when he cites from the Jewish scriptures, sometimes from the Greek, sometimes from the Hebrew, and sometimes a mix of the two. He just doesn't crudely take a passage from the Old Testament and say, oh, look, this talks about Jesus, and then plop it down in the middle of his gospel. He's very subtle in the way he does so, and he uses them to make points or convey ideas that require more than just a quick surface reading on our part. Enough about that. The next video is going to be on his use of Galilee of the Gentiles in chapter 4. And I'm going to look at that in more detail then. Structure. Usually when you're studying the book of the Bible, you have to hunt and peck around in ancient documents like these to figure out its structure and how the book is organized. The challenge with Matthew is that he provides an overabundance of these features. Perhaps the most important or best known are his five uses of and when Jesus finished, the dot, the dot, the dot. This occurs in 728, 11, 1, 1353, 19, 1, and 1. And I have a whole video on how Matthew is organized. And I'll have a link up here for you if you're interested. And I will also have a link in the show more section under the video. Matthew also likes to use geographical or spatial references in his gospel. Notice, right at the start, a star leads the Magi from the east to Jesus. Within his gospel, mountains, sun, moon, Galilee, and other locations figure prominently in how he tells his story. They're just not referenced to move the story along. They contain meaning as well. Literary mastery. One cannot overlook the literary beauty of Matthew's gospel. 
If you read Mark and then turn to Matthew and read a similar passage, you will immediately realize that Matthew has a much richer and beautiful literary flourish to his account of Jesus' life. At the macro level, this is seen in how he organizes gospel. Again, see that video. Okay, let me give you a little teaser that's not in that video, and this is absolutely free, no charge at all. At the very start and the end of his gospel, Matthew makes use of a literary feature called an inclusio, or a bookend, something that brackets what comes in between. In Matthew 1.23, he quotes Isaiah 7.14, Behold, a virgin will bear a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. And then he explains for us what this means, which means God with us. At the very end of his gospel in 2820, as he is commissioning his church to go and make disciples of all the world, Jesus gives a promise. And lo, I am with you always. And this whole idea that God is with us or that Christ is with us is one of these promises that bookends his gospel. This is perhaps the most important inclusio within his gospel, but there are lots of others in smaller sections as well. Matthew also likes to group things. This is best seen in how he collects Jesus' teachings into five major discourses or sermons. The Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7. The Discipleship Discourse in chapter 10. A collection of parables in chapter 13. The Community Discourse in chapter 18. And then his Apocalyptic Discourse in chapters 24 and 25. Each of these five discourses focus on the theme of God's kingdom, and it's central to them, but each time the focus is slightly different. Micro level. At the micro level, Matthew displays a rich grammatical style. Take, for instance, the Lord's Prayer. This is recorded in both Matthew and Luke's Gospel. But if you've heard this prayer in church or in some other setting, I would bet that you heard Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer. Why? Well, let's take a look at it. Luke has, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Now, this is out of the English Standard Version. But is that the way you've heard it, memorized it, or heard it read in church? Probably not. Now let's take a look at Matthew's version. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Which version are you familiar with? That's what I thought, Matthew's. Notice how Matthew has carefully structured this so that it works as a prayer within worship. Finally, like Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew's intended audience was the churches he worked in. What makes Matthew unique is that his gospel is essentially an ecclesial document. It's intended to shape the life and practices of the church that he's writing to. Where you could say that the others are intended to do that as well. But Matthew lets us know this directly. For example, if we go back to the Lord's Prayer, we are told, pray like this, right at the very start. As believers, Matthew records Jesus' prayer in a way that speaks directly to us, this is how we are to pray. Or, if we go over to chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, Jesus is teaching what to do if your brother sins. First, you go to them in private and talk to them. If that doesn't work, you approach them with two or three other witnesses. If they still refuse, tell it to the whole church. And if this person refuses to listen to the church, cheat them like a Gentile or a pagan. Now, wait a minute. The church is not going to come about until after Jesus' death and resurrection. So what's going on here? Matthew is taking Jesus' teachings and recording them in a way that not only convey Jesus' intentions, but also make them directly applicable to the church. So why study Matthew? Well, it's been the favorite gospel of the church throughout history. Matthew's use of the Old Testament is very interesting and thought-provoking. 
Matthew's gospel is also highly structured and this helps us to understand it. There's also a literary beauty and mastery to his gospel. At the micro level, the way Matthew words his gospel is very artistic, even more so in the Greek, which I hope to explain as we go through these videos. Matthew wrote his gospel as a manual for the church, not just to teach us about Jesus, but how to live our lives within that community of followers. Got your interest? Great. Stick around. Subscribe and hit the bell icon and then YouTube will do its job and let you know when I have finished my next video on Matthew. You don't even have to search for it, they'll let you know. Until then, peace.